Hi everyone, Tim Topham here, and uh, as promised, I wanted to come online today to give you an overview of some of the changes I've made to my own practice. And I'm actually gonna demonstrate some of the things that I do, uh, because what I've worked out for this year is that uh, making practice a priority is gonna be really important in my own uh, teaching. I should have been prioritizing it for years. Uh, I've found as I've been growing other things and speaking and, and doing all my online blogging and podcasting, it's taken a big back seat and I don't want that to happen this year. So uh, here's my overview of the kinds of things I'm doing. And the main reason I wanna share this with you and not just keep it to myself is to see if it might be useful to some of you. Um, I know that many of us all as piano teachers want to practice more or want to play the piano more. It's, it's our passion, it's the thing that brought us to, to do what we do, but very few of us have the time or commit the time to actually continuing our own playing. And so uh, this is what today's all about, giving you some ideas about how you could potentially do this yourself. Now, excuse me if I look quite red in the face, I've literally just got back and had a shower from um, a cycling class. So. For those of you who know me, you're probably aware I'm a big cyclist and uh, my favorite thing in the morning is to do some cycling. So uh, Monday morning for me is a cycling class at 6.30. Uh, I got back at sort of 7.30 and uh, now it's 8 a.m. here. Uh, so uh, I'll have breakfast after this. Um, and I, I have to say that after running the piano pivot at the end of last year, the five day piano pivot, uh, many of you probably were involved in that. There was uh, about 800 people I think who took part. Uh, one of the things we talked about was your own health and looking after yourself. And so uh, I would really encourage you, um, if, uh, if you're interested in making practice, a bit of a, um, a, a resolution for you this year, if you want to call it that, then also looking at your own health and, and, and getting, getting out and about. Uh, and that can just be walking. Uh, and of course, the best thing to do while you go for a walk is, of course, listen to my podcast. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me, I, I haven't played today. I've literally turned on, um, now this is the Casio Hybrid that I've uh, done some reviews on before. It's a great instrument and I'm still enjoying uh, very much using it for my practice. So um, my, my starting thing is, uh, is just easy scales. So I'll pick a key and I tend to pick a different key every day uh, and I'll just run up and down you know, relatively straightforward. And maybe, uh, you know, in thirds. Uh, I also like the grand scale, so this sort of thing. that for, I don't know, two or three minutes, uh, you know, playing fairly easily. Uh, I'm not stressing about anything. Uh, I, I make the, the link between, you know, gymnasts. Gymnasts, when they first get into the gym to practice whatever they're doing to that day, are not going to jump in and suddenly do the hardest thing that they've ever done. So take it slowly, just enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy playing slowly uh, and you know giving it a little bit of time. I better just check. I can see some comments coming through um, as I go there. Um, so uh, yeah, just let me know if, you, if the sounds uh, you got any issues with the sound or anything like that. Okay, now I also am a big fan of um, four finger exercises. Now I, I, I will learn these from a teacher of mine. I think they're kind of meditative. Um, and I'll actually put out some more information specifically about these, but this is how they sound. So that's using fingers two, three, four, five, going chromatically up. Uh, and you can also use fingers one, two, three, four, same thing. And you can go 
down and up. So I, I tend to uh, quite enjoy doing that. Um, it's quite relaxing in some ways, but it also just get, it gets, it's a, one of the best ways for me to get my fingers working. So I call them four finger exercises. I either go up um, using two to five or down, and then down using one to four or, or just mixing it up um, however you want to do it. Sorry, I'm actually still sweating from my, uh, my run. Apologies for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next thing I'll do is tend to, I mean, that's very small and um, using uh, lots of little finger movements. So then I like to spread out over the keyboard. So uh, my best uh, tip for that is to use uh, seventh arpeggios. So I do a series where I'll play uh, a major chord with a major seventh. Dominant seventh. same thing with a minor triad at the bottom or an uh, augmented triad so this or this or a minor and I'll only go up and down as many times as I need to become happy with what I'm actually doing uh, I find those are great because they're arpeggios, so you're using the whole keyboard. So I've gone from something that's very intricate to then using the whole keyboard. Uh, and because they use all five fingers, everything's getting a workout. Whereas, you know, if you're doing a normal arpeggio, there's always, there's always a finger missing out. Uh, so that's why I like doing those. Um, what else? I also, uh, I sometimes use Hannon. Uh, I don't mind a little bit of Hannon. Uh, I don't often use it for my students, but for me, uh, sometimes. Uh, and the other thing that I tend to do is uh, octave scales. So uh, a lot of the literature that I'm working on at the moment has quite difficult octave passages in it. So actually getting the hands ready to play octaves. I was always taught by my teacher to think about octave playing like bouncing a basketball. This is a great trick for, for students as well. If they're having trouble, just get them to bounce a bas an imaginary basketball in the air like this. And then that's basically the idea of octaves. So yeah, can be, can be a good little trick. So my octave routine is to, uh, I'm not sure where I necessarily start uh, on the cycle, but I go through a cycle of fourths. Uh, which sound like this. So it's the major scale uh, here. To the minor. That tends to work really, really well for me. Uh, I don't ever get all the way around. Uh, you can get quite tense doing that. So if this is new to you, don't suddenly jump in and start <laughs> doing that exercise. It can be quite difficult. Uh, but it's a good way for me to just get my, my hands, again, moving from all different shapes. So very compact playing to spreading out arpeggios uh, to scales, which again are very kind of uh, smaller movements, and then to big octave movements as well. Um, so all up, I'll take generally about 15 to 20 minutes on just pure technical exercises, no music at all. Um, but the thing that I like to do uh, straight after that is to actually put some of those exercises into musical contexts. So what I'll tend to do then is uh, find passages that I know are really good for technical work in pieces of music that I'm working on. So, for example, um, I at the moment I'm revising my Chopin Scherzo number no. three in C sharp minor. So that's the. Uh, that might be a piece that you uh, are familiar with. So there's a, a cracker octave passage towards the the latter half that's great to do after you've done the warm up. So I'll then work on that. And it will often be quite messy at the start. Okay, 
etc. And I'll go through and put one of those technical exercises into a musical context because I'm a, I'm a believer. Uh, I think I read it first from Baron Boim or, or someone like that who believed very, very strongly in less of just scales and exercises and more scales and exercises in musical context. So, you know, if you're playing Mozart, then that's great. Use all those scale runs and passages in Mozart to practice your technique. For Chopin, you know, it's, Chopin's full of technical challenges. So uh, that's a great one. I'm also working on those beautiful um, descending passages. That's, I think, probably my favorite part of... Um, Actually playing this, just turning my cooler on, so I hope that won't uh, disturb things too much. So playing, uh, where was I working yesterday? Oh yeah, so if you're familiar with this piece, you'll, you'll probably know this section. So those descending passages are just fantastic for arpeggio work because it's all arpeggios in the left hand. And I can feel, because it's morning and I haven't really warmed up very well, this is actually quite difficult to play. And it's kind of clunky. I definitely need to warm up more, but that's just showing you how I put these kind of things in context. So, you know, it's all very well for me playing that. That's just really to get my head in the game so that I can then do things like this. And it's much more fun. It's much more musical, obviously. Um, and it's practicing something that I'm going to be hopefully playing in the future. Um, I also am currently working on revising... Um, well, I'll play a little bit of it. See, I'm going to start in the middle of this piece. Let's see who can first guess uh, this, this piece. Starting in the middle, and it's really slow, okay? Uh, this is another great one I like using for arpeggios, and this is the section that I'm working on. So see if you can write down uh, what this one is. Someone said the tone on the piano. Yeah, look, this is um, it's actually on one of the. There's a whole lot of different pianos in here. It's actually on the modern concert grand sound, so it's actually it's quite bright, but I quite like that for for my playing. Um, can anyone pick what piece of music that was? Be uh, be really interested to know. Here's another section. <laughs> Bissoni, no, not Bissoni. Uh, starts like this. Which I don't really want to play until I've warmed up properly. Um, so that's another piece of music that I'm working on, but I'm, I'm showing you that because again, it's, it's putting context to the arpeggios that I was doing at the start. This is what, you know, Playing those in context, much more fun to me than, than doing any more of this than I have to. Um, Schubert Impromptu? No, not Schubert Impromptu. Uh, if I was to play it really fast, I'm sure probably people would get it. <laughs> I wish I could play it that fast. It's uh, Chopin uh, Etude number one in C major. So uh, that's another one on my list of things uh, to practice at the moment. So I guess what I'm, I'm showing you is the way I structure my practice uh, is all based around the music that I want to learn. And so choosing something is just so vital. You're not going to do any practice and nor, let's be honest with ourselves, 
nor are any of our students really going to enjoy any practice if they don't enjoy the piece of music that they're actually playing. So what I think is crucial, if you're interested in making a commitment to practice, as I have this year, um, find the music that just you want to play more than anything, even if it's a little bit hard. Like that Chopin etude, uh, if I could play that at the end of this year at a speed even remotely what the masters do, then I'll be quite impressed. But I don't mind that I'm struggling with it because it's making me a better pianist. And that's why I love classical music for improving my technique. Uh, and so while many of you will know me as kind of the pop and chords guy, for my own practice, I want to keep my chops up. I want to keep my skill and my fingers moving. Pop's not going to do that. Classical music will. And so that's why for all my students, even if they are quite interested in pop music, I'm getting them to do classical, getting them to do romantic, getting them to do a mix of music because it's through that kind of music that they're really going to improve. So before I go on to the kind of next part of my practice, I should have said actually what my goal has been for this year. And really the goal is one hour of practice, uh, one hour to one and a half hours, depending on how I go. Now, uh, for those of you who, who were on my last live call, you'll remember that I said that I wasn't very successful even last year, even when I made this commitment to do, because I tried this last year as well, do an hour's practice a day. It did not work. And the reason was because I didn't commit to the time. So the change I've made is to say first thing in the morning, have breakfast and practice. There, nothing else. I, I don't check emails. I don't go on social. I don't turn my phone, I don't check emails on my phone or anything. I just practice. And I actually, I have to say that that hour between 8 and 9 a.m. or 8 and 9.30 is real gold for me now. It's, it's just beautiful time with me and music and the piano, the instrument that has brought me to everything that I'm doing. Uh, and I can just enjoy that time with myself without any interruptions. Now, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not taking kids to school and, and, and those kinds of things in the morning, so it's perhaps a little bit easier for me than for others. What I would be saying is that you just need to find a time for yourself that suits. So maybe if you've got um, kids and you're taking them to school, maybe your time is from 9 till 10.30 uh, or 9 till 10, or maybe just half an hour to start with. That, that's fine, but find your time and stick to it, commit to it. That would be what I suggest for you. Um, when I first started my Inner Circle community, one of the first things I got everyone to do was a one-week practice challenge. And uh, at the moment, I'm just kind of I'm working out how to re-engage people into this practice challenge because I haven't been pushing it recently. Uh, the reason I want to re-engage people in it is because it makes a real difference. People get such a buzz from finally committing and getting back to practice. Um, so uh, I... I'm a big believer in this and I've made a real commitment to it. So far, so good. And my hands aren't feeling like bricks anymore, which they did at the end of last year. Now, I did my diploma only six years ago or thereabouts. And I was practicing an hour and a half a day, plus, or oh, probably three hours a day actually, plus weekend time. Um, and uh, I just remember how beautifully subtle, supple and agile my fingers were. If I could get back to that, that would be great. Okay, so my practice, I've done the warm-up technical exercises. I've then done technical exercises in a musical context, just picking little, little bits and pieces of my uh, pieces that I'm learning. Uh, and then I'd get on to the rest of the practice that I'm going to do. So for me, at the moment, I'm, um, I'm about to start traveling around Australia to promote and um, explore these with teachers. So these are, these are the exam books for the Australian Music Exam Board that I've helped put together. So I need to be able to demonstrate things from these books. And there's uh, nine books with 12 pieces each, and I really need to be able to play most of them, at least the first part of them, to give the teachers there uh, an experience of it. So that's what I then move on to. Um, and I'm not gonna put you through actually watching me practice, because that would be incredibly boring. Um, but just to say, you know, that's kind of the next stage. So I'll, and, and I'll have, I'll know exactly which pieces of music and which bits to go to. So on this sheet of paper here, this has got my list of my workouts, so my technical exercises, just to remind me. I actually did this when I started. I don't really refer to this anymore. Uh, and then down here is my little A, M, E, B list. So, you know, grade four book, I need to just work on the left hand of the Barons. Uh, in grade five, I need to do the Jingpo folk, folk song. So that's what happens for the next you know, hour or 
45 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, and what I find, I must say, that as soon as I start getting into some of the technical parts of my pieces, so one of the other pieces I'm working on is the Fantasy in F minor by Chopin. As you can tell, I'm a big Chopin fan. Uh, you know, this has a great octave passage work uh, right, right in the middle. It does it twice and it's, it does this. Uh, and this work. And then it does. So that, you know, it, that's another great bit of work. I don't know about you, but what I find is as soon as I start playing these bits, I'll play it, uh, so I'll do, do that. And suddenly I'm off and I'm playing the rest of the piece of music. It's incredibly frustrating. I suddenly realize about four minutes later that, oh, I've actually just played on and I should have stuck to what I was doing. Do you guys find the same thing? Kids do it all the time, don't they? Uh, I'm often correcting them in lesson, just stop, stop playing, go back, same bit, do that again, do this bit again. <laughs> because it's really easy to play on. Uh, and after that bit in this Chopin is one of my favorite sections, it does this great section. this kind of military march that happens and it's always been one of my favorite parts of this piece so it's so easy to play on so uh, again you know one of the great reasons um, I like putting myself through things like lessons with another teacher or my own exam you know doing an exam myself or just practicing is because it reminds you of those things that students will do that could be improved um, that you need to pick up on as a teacher but it's much more obvious when you're doing it yourself. And you can say, oh, I did that in my practice this morning. Uh, I know how easy it is to do that. Let's get back on track and focus. We're just doing those three bars. Okay, so that could be uh, something else that might be helpful for you. Um, oh, Samara is gonna be at the Adelaide talk. Brilliant, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to heading over as well. It's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna be good. So now you've seen the background to uh, actually the, what goes on, <laughs> or a little bit of it anyway. Uh, so look, have you got any questions about uh, how you could um, set up a practice routine or anything else about the music that I'm learning myself or how I do it or my technical exercises? Um, I'm actually going to be focusing much more on technique later this year with a full a webinar and a course um, outlining exactly what I do for beginners, intermediate and advanced students uh, because often we forget that um, many of us are teaching a whole range of students and giving students, advanced students, just scales is actually not all that practical because if they've been learning piano for 10 years, uh, they're gonna be sick of scales. Who wants to play scales for that many years, right? Uh, and y yes, they're great, but there are other ways that you can improve technique. So um, I'll be sharing a whole lot of my ideas around that uh, later this year. Uh, and while some questions come through, I'll check those in just a moment. I did wanna remind you that it, at exactly this time, next Monday, so in one week's time, uh, I'm gonna be jumping on and having a web running a webinar, uh, and we're gonna be doing this with uh, Nicola Canton, uh, who of course, as you know, is a great friend of mine um, from Colorful Keys, and we're gonna be running a webinar called Successful Strategies for Thriving in a New or Improved Studio. It's a great one to start the year. I'm very much looking forward to sharing the content of this with you. Things like studio policies, how much you should charge, uh, enrollment forms, new student interviews, communicating with parents, some basic marketing ideas, um, planning your curriculum and your lessons and lesson formats are some of the topics that we're going to be covering in that um, one hour free training. If you're interested in that, head to timtopham.com slash webinar uh, and you'll be able to sign up. As you know, you know my, my whole thing with the webinars is to give you lots and lots of great content uh, that's really, really helpful and based on questions and things that I get from people. So stay tuned for that. And just as a little uh, teaser for next month, so end of February, my webinar is gonna be one that I'm doing solo and it's all about musical, what I call musical mashups. So how to get creative and off the page with any piece of music. So that's coming up uh, next month. Uh, do look out for that. Let me have a look. I can see there's a couple of uh, comments here. Uh, Le, Tori says, wondering if you ever use, 
um, books such as the Cherney or Pishner exercises and what your thoughts are on these. Um, yes, I, I do like uh, I do like some Cherney in moderation, I guess, a little bit like Hannon to me. Uh, some of his music can be quite musical and enjoyable to play, but a lot of it less so. Uh, Pishner I'm not that familiar with, so to I'd say, uh, for my own practice, not so much, but for my students, yes, I have used Cherney before, uh, but more in the context, to be honest, of um, repertoire for assessments and examinations. Um, for example, Cherney uh, Opus 740, I think it is, uh, is pretty popular and there's some great works in that for the early advanced students. Um, but even at, uh, even at lower levels, I remember finding a great churning exercise which had um, all exercises on repeated notes, uh, which was a you know, great one to use. So I would say, look, use them sp sparingly and use them for a particular purpose. If a student needs to improve repeated notes or staccato or something, then maybe a short uh, churning exercise could be helpful. Um, just make it a really musical one that you can uh, enjoy. Uh, are you preparing the Chopin, etc., for a particular recital or anything? Uh, no, just for my own enjoyment, Rebecca. Although my plan would be to um, be able to play these and record them and put them on YouTube. So that's the goal for me because I've never actually recorded. I've got a number of things on YouTube, even advanced things, but um, these works I've never got to the point of being able to record. So I would really love to do that. Whether I get there, Rebecca, I'm not really sure. Um, certainly don't ask me to play it when you see me in, uh, in England soon. <laughs> um, let me have a look here. Yeah, keep any comments coming through. Uh, I'll just pop back here. Yeah, Linda, uh, uh, classical keeps technique up. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing better than uh, classical music for improving your technique, in my opinion. Um, great, so uh, look, I hope that's been helpful for you. Uh, I really look forward to joining you. I really look forward to seeing you uh, on the webinar this time next week. Uh, TimTopham.com slash webinar will get you the uh, access link and we'll shoot out an email as well. If this has been of interest to you, um, yeah, let me know with a thumbs up or a share. If, if you've got other people who might find this interesting too, feel free to share it. Uh, I must say that I'm feeling uh, really positive about this approach. I've found my time, it's working for me. I can't do it every day. For example, tomorrow I'm gonna to be traveling so I won't be able to have my practice time but I'm gonna to have to make up for it at another stage. Uh, but I'm already feeling much more positive about my own ability to play and demonstrate things for students. Um, and also just, just reconnecting with the instrument I think is really, uh, really important for us. It's very easy just to get really quite disconnected from our own playing ability. So uh, if you can find a way that you can sit at the piano and enjoy your, your I'd say, playing, practicing, um, find some music that you really are passionate about, that you really love, uh, at th that's at the right level for you. Maybe just a little bit harder than where you can comfortably play, that could be great. Um, or as you know, we do with most of our students, you know, give them a couple of hard pieces and give them some easier ones. Give yourself some easier pieces too that you can just enjoy playing. Uh, and I remember there was a thread uh, about practice um, quite recently on, on Facebook. People were saying, yeah, look, I'm really enjoying playing some pop music and teaching myself to play by ear and so I'm improving those skills. That's my practice. That's what those um, teachers were saying. So that's great. Do what is going to be uh, most helpful and relevant to you and also that's going to really you know, get you back to that passion for piano, which is really easy to lose when you're just eight hours a day teaching, teaching kids, all right? So thank you very much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing a number of people um, here in Adelaide tomorrow. I'll be uh, flying over to Adelaide to talk about um, this new series of books. Um, and then the next trip after that will be on the, looking at my calendar here, the 4th of February, when I'm up in Sydney. Uh, so those Sydney siders uh, who are interested in seeing me, um, contact your local AMEB office uh, for that. Uh, any other questions, uh, feel free to leave them. I'll be checking back on the video. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know how you go. And if you try this out yourself, even just for a week, just commit to one week, five days even. I'm gonna play for 30 minutes for five days. 
just for me. See what happens. Let me know. Bye-bye.